Uh, welcome to the Great War Discussion Group. The speaker for today is Stephen Dietz, who has had a longtime interest in optics and for our purposes, especially uh, military optics uh, during World War I. Like every other technological field, the, the great advances of the previous hundred years uh, were heavily used during the battles of World War I, and an entirely new field of optics was even developed, there, namely aerial photography, uh, which will be the subject of our uh, discussion group next month. So Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. So as a level set for this presentation, it is an overview. Far more detail is available. And if I, as I said, I think before everyone joined, if I had done this in person, I would have brought examples and be showing them and passing them around. But I think it would have been a really good way to show how important and revolutionary uh, military optics were. So I do this in sort of a logic of four acts uh, and the logic of breaking this into four different uh, bits so that you understand uh, an introduction and then details as a whole. The sources that I've utilized as a whole are varied, and you can see them on there, including the National World War I Museum. But the majority probably came from personally acquired documents, books, photographs, and the optical devices themselves. I probably have 35 to 50 sources that I could provide direct reference from this presentation today if I really wanted to. So pop quiz. How many examples of military optics or glass are found within the museum? Any guesses? I don't have my conversation piece pulled up, but there's over 30 examples and I'm probably missing some. These include uh, individuals using binoculars on the Pantheon de la Guerre, the rangefinders over in the east, and then uh, the medical glass in the medicine uh, display area for test tubes and such for the military glass. And it, it's amazing when you start looking for military optics and military glass, how they are there in the museum itself. So what's the difference between military optics and military glass? Military optics are generally any optical device that have been contracted by the government and they meet the specific standards and specifications for use, while glass can be test tubes, optics, I mean, uh, ceramics, goggles, drinking glasses. Uh, it, it, the, it's much broader in field. The glasses that were utilized for drinking are an example of military glass because those would have a stamp of US Army or US Navy on the bottom, similar to the silverware that you sometimes see. Prior to 1890, all binoculars and handheld telescopes were based on Galilean optics, which is basically something that was created in 1609 of convex and concave magnifying uh, lenses put together to create an initial three power uh, telescope. And then over time, they literally were able to create up to a, a much higher magnitude. The, there were mirrors that were used to increase the, the capability and shorten the length. But the Poro prism or use of prisms for optic magnification wasn't really conceived until the 1850s. And it wasn't really until 1890s that Zeiss, the company of Zeiss, with the quality of glass finally available, patented a the design for a Poro design. It, the individual was an Italian named Poro in the 1850s. That's why it's called a Poro uh, design. And they held that patent until 1908. Other lens producing companies had to create their own design and it really the race was on. And so consequently you would have the US with Bosch and Lohm Zeiss 
France, Kraus Zeiss, as well as subsidiaries of Zeiss in London, St. Petersburg, all uh, over the world. There was even a Zeiss Tokyo, very small. But other com German companies were really trying to race to create something. And it was because Zeiss had the head start. It was much simpler to license the binoculars. So here's a fairly poor, simple example. The upper in the upper left is how your eye works, where you see the arrow pointing up and it just inverses it and it goes and such. Right below it is how a Galilean telescope with a, an objective lens and an eyepiece lens and you look through the back and it reverses it correctly. Now at the bottom below that is how a prism works. It goes into the prism, angles out into another prism, angles out and sends out. By doing that, it shortens the length, creates a much lighter device, and at the same time improves light capturing capability and the field of view. If you look at the example from 1900s, uh, early 1900s, the bottom would have been what would have been a telescope or a low quality binocular, while the upper image was what you would see with a, a prism type binocular. The reason why I'm using binoculars for this discussion is because even though military optics would be found in field telescopes as well as rangefinders, artillery uh, rangefinders and such, it really, it's the best examples to show how much change and how revolutionary it was in the same way as the internal combustion engine, electric light, machine gun, and even the radio. All of these were late 19th century, early 20th century inventions. And it made the telescopes and rangefinders better at light capture, field of view, as well as lighter weight. And so it created better when you're dealing with a rangefinder, it created a much more precise capability to identify distance and such. So here's a simple example from 1908 uh, showing the difference between, and this was an ad for Bosch and Lone Size. They're both six power or six uh, magnitude of, and that the, the one on the right is a Galilean design, and it would weigh close to two to three times the weight of that uh, binocular. And that if you were looking in comparison, that is fairly representative of how big a six power uh, magnitude would have to be for an older Galilean style. And once again, you see the sailboats and the ordinary binocular glass versus the Bosch and Lohm Zeiss. So what makes optical glass optical glass? And it's graded by clarity, transparency, the striae, which is little filaments in the glass it, to, that can literally change. And the Germans, the Gina factory in Germany in 1890 had truly perfected a high quality uh, optical glass and only German, it was considered a state secret and only German had that high standard of glass. Great Britain and France uh, glass was inferior to the German glass and the US glass was even more inferior to the Great British glass. So between 1890 to 1914, German optical glass dominates and there's even utilized in non-German products. Uh, between, in 1913, the issue of, in Britain, 60% of all optical glass being utilized yeah. was coming from Germany and 21% yes. was Zeiss specific. Yeah. Hi, Laura. I'm on Zoom. Here's the 1908 uh, ads from various different magazines okay. that are in. Okay, one up. is up there, uh, right is Britain, Carl Zeiss for the Zeiss London. The lower is Krauss in Paris. And over to the left is the Bosch alone, taken from a National Geographic. And you can see that all of them use 
the, the same design logic of advertising of how important and how great uh, the glass was or uh, the uh, German glass. Even with uh, trying to sell it to American armies. So here was an ad that was found in one of the military artillery journal of the period in 1912. And that journal basically was trying for the army pattern, and it was talking about being officially adopted by German and Russian governments. And it truly shows, again, how the reliance on before the war for German glass. So what's the difference between military optics and non-military optics? The military optics utilize designs for both durable wartime use and the glass has to meet a prior documented standard. And the specification of a high quality optical glass is required. And then for non-military, it uses a lower quality glass, which is not uh, transmitting the color, there's greater distortion and greater potential for visual aberration. Anyone who has looked at some old Galilean style binoculars and then look at even of that period, uh, prism based binoculars, you would notice immediately the clarity and capability from a hundred years on of how high a quality they are. The military optics usually standardized on a six power, six X power uh, or higher where non-military optics might use, such as opera glass, might only be two to four power. And you didn't have to have as high a quality of glass when you're dealing with less than six power. The French being French though, standardized on seven power as their standard versus a six power, which is what most governments standardize on. So when you look at a, different uh, units and I, I don't know if you can see this but I have a pair in my hand of military optics and there is a it's all metal with a leather cover there is a cover to cover the top lens there is individual focus for each side so that everyone has a large neural uh, knob for adjusting the the distance because not everyone has the same width of eye. Also, what might also be inside would be a reticule or graticule of, of radiations to give indications. And then as the war came, there were special eyepieces that would be used for goggles, gas masks and such. And that there would also be on the outside for it to use them as rangefinders when the rangefinder wasn't being utilized, it had, you might find outside attachments to help identify rangefinder use. So if you look here on the left are non-military, all of them are center focus. They are not individual focus, even that prism glass that's in the smaller. There is, well, eye shade that is available. Let's see if I can do this right. Yes, there's, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, there's eye shades available, but not on all of them. But over here on the military side, this is what would be a 12 to 20 power uh, binocular. And it would normally be utilized up here as a, a binocular for C use. Down here is one that was utilized for the machine gun crews of Germany. This one is where I was talking about these little brass plates on each side have, and if I, I'm not sure if I can do this right, let's see if I can pull this over. There we go. You can see here that there is a horse up here and there's a soldier as well and that by the distance, how close they were by using the graticule and uh, graticule, the French used these as the uh, replacement for range finders.
So when we talk about military optics standards and specifications, they define the weight, the size, the durability, functional use. And Germany, with their optics uh, dominance, basically had the most detailed and everyone else sort of followed their lead. And before 1900, only France and Great Britain had, and they literally were almost side by side copies of the German standards. And it was the reason for this was that Germany's glass was being utilized. Other countries had either less rigorous standards or specifications, or they were just beginning to create them. By 1914, as you see here, only Austria, Germany, France, Switzerland, and Great Britain had created detailed standards for, they were started in the United States, but they still weren't there yet. So smaller pop quiz, this is global production just for high quality optical glass. And you can see the red is Germany and they produce over 90%. If you include the lower quality glass for civilian use, they still dominate with 60% and the, but the French and the British wedges get bigger. But my question is, which of these wedges is the United States? And the answer is number five that you can barely see at the top. So we move on to the war, October 1914. I don't start in with August or September because of the fog of war and the availability. Everyone is thinking it's going to be a short, quick war and that they thought that, oh, we can get by with what we have. And the British blockade shuts off direct supply to everything but the alternative supply routes initiated through Denmark and Sweden. And these would primarily go to US and then on to other countries. But Britain, France, Italy, and Russia are all immediately affected. So is it companies that sold or used German optics of the Allies, those materials and companies were confiscated or converted. And there's an almost a spy novel event that occurs in 1915, a corporate mutual benefit effort was set, tried between Germany through Switzerland to ship glass, optical glass to their enemy, meaning Great Britain. But it failed. Uh, all of the negotiations fell apart. And the bottom line, German optics aren't available any longer, but the need is everywhere. So what were they, you know, this is a quick example. You use the military optics in rifle scopes, periscopes. You would also use them for the rangefinders themselves. Of, as you can see in the upper left on each one of the uh, artillery and field guns. And for the Germans with the submarine warfare, you see a 10 power binocular that the gentleman is using and that the other gentleman is going, that you see his pants leg in the background is going to reach down and you'll see it's a totally different design, but it is also a 10 power binoculars. And if you notice, it's a barrel shape. It's a different design of prism glass. Whoops. Excellent. Sorry. So both France and Britain realized high quality glass needs before the war, but and both had different issues to resolve and uh, take care of. In France, there was only one major manufacturer of high quality glass, and that was Paramontois. And they had the capability, but because it was so costly at the time, they had almost their entire factory focused on lower quality or LQ quality glass, and didn't really have the means and the other smaller ventures to ramp up once war was declared. In Britain, it's like they had also small shop ventures, but none really produced 
consistent high quality glass. There was only one major high quality glass producer of the Chance Brothers, and they had major uh, production contracts through Barn Stroud, which was a rangefinder and binocular manufacturer, and Ross. Now, it, this combination, they literally had locked up the capability for any other company to buy Chance Brothers glass of any high quality. So the initial solution, confiscation. As I said earlier, the Zeiss London and the uh, Zeiss uh, Russia, as well as uh, Zeiss Paris, were all confiscated, at both finished product, finished glass and raw glass. Raw glass would be glass like diamonds in its raw form and it has not been ground down or polished to the needed, where the finished product might be a Zeiss uh, binocular. The, all of this was converted and acquired by Ross uh, binoculars. In France, Krauss, the German glass was, quote, donated to the cause. That's the way it's described. And then there's the patriotic requisition, appealed both uh, to the landowners, the aristocracy, for fit their finished products, such as rifle scopes, spotting scopes, telescopes, binoculars, and on and on, just to meet the demand. The expectation, once again, was that it would be a short war and that they didn't have any need. Similar to the artillery production in Britain, where they were only producing enough for artillery uh, gun to fire 20 shells, 20 to 30 shells per day. So, but the real solution was to create a comparable high quality glass quickly and it would meet the needs of, but unfortunately this does not happen until close to 1916. The Chance Brothers were forced by the royal government to partially share some of their secrets to help manufacture. I say it's partially share because what Chance Brothers actually did was that they became part owners of these many of these smaller companies. And it was more of a minor takeover even during the war. And then at the same time, Ross uh, did research of the confiscated documents when they took over his Iceland, which gave insight, but not the whole story for high quality optical glass. Worse, the products such as binoculars were just not as good as the German products in 1914. And it really becomes apparent. And so there were literally raids by the British uh, and the French to go across the lines during their raids to acquire binoculars and any type of German optics as part of the raid. And that type of raid was, it was actually, if you brought one, one of those items back and kept it in possession, it was a courts martial offense in the British and in the French military. So you were expected to immediately turn it over to the higher officers. British rangefinders of Barr and Stroud were generally used for naval spotting and artillery. And these were superior to the Germans, but most Barr and Stroud rangefinders were possessed by the British Navy. Now, the size of these rangefinders that Barn Straw made were anywhere from 70 centimeters, which is just about 30 inches long, to a total of eight feet. So think of a bar. I don't have, you'll see a smaller version, which is the 40 inch version in a moment, but it's, they made huge rangefinders. So, their solution at times was all over the place. Uh, the Atchison, which you see over clear over to the left, was first designed and created during the Boer War. And it would be like the, those collapsible cups. It would expand, and the, the idea was is that it would create a Galilean that was easy to carry. The middle glass was one that utilized mirrors and uh, prisms to save on the glass and such, but it would be generally used for the 
cavalry and it would fold into a very flat small container and that you would literally fold it up the problem with that design was that it was very complex to make and it would lose its what's known as culmination keeping the eyes in focus very easily finally on the far right is the ross binocular design which was a very superior binocular but at the same time it made everything inverted so this if you were using it on the sea the sea became up above and the sky was down below and so it made things very difficult uh, for people at first using those but those that use them consistently the eyes would adjust and everything would turn back to normal so the end result was that the British and the French would make do with lower quality Galilean style optical instruments until high quality glass was available. The British officer with his Galilean at the work table is a, more of a common sight that you would see. You see over on the left, uh, the, you can barely make it out, but there is a crow's foot on both of the glasses. This is a five power. This is a six power glass. They both were made by the same manufacturer. And that these would have been given a grade of either an S3 or an S4. Uh, their optics that they were utilized were given grades per glass that were being utilized for the quality of glass. And Galilean binoculars were generally never higher than an S3 level. So we move to Act 3. In Germany, there were over 10 major optic producers. They were all pretty much reliant on the Gina glass works. But these were like lights, pencil, gores, uh, lots of names that you even would recognize today uh into the second world war many of these became acquired by zeiss later on but it, at the time it, there were over 10 major producers and there were 15 over 15 different models now the df set meant dienstfeldglas and meaning service field glass and the fg down at the end are filled glass, and those are Galilean designs. But the 99A was a design made in 1899, and it was designed specifically for the artillery. Now, what's interesting is that the artillery of Germany utilized that until about 1915. The DF-03 was utilized, it was not a Zeiss design, it was utilized by uh, Gore's uh, lights all the other manufacturers to get around the German uh, the Zeiss uh, patent at the time and then from that point on the numbers meant four power six power six power uh, and, and that the first six it was a six by 20 and then they became the, the standard even into today of the six by 30 binocular of the DF six by 30, seven meant seven power and such. And it does not even include the variations. There were eight different rifle scopes and five different types of range finders with Gores being the predominant one utilized on artillery. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the lack of standardization is that they made, it, Gores made range finders that were unique to each gun so that whether it be a howitzer or a field gun or a mortar there, the glass, the range finder would look the same, but would not work on, uh, the howitzer would not work on the field gun. And it literally, they had slightly different mounts to make sure that people didn't mix or match. And you sort of see that if you go over to the east uh, display case and you'll see five or six different uh, Gores and Zeiss rangefinders for artillery. And those it all look, if you look, are really paying attention, are all slightly different. Here are some different 
uh, examples. The upper left is a different type of prism design called the dialect. And that design is currently used for binoculars even today. And it's what is the most common design for inline prism use. And the, then the barrel shape right next to it is a high uh, light gathering prism design that was designed. But the others are generally uh, utilized all the way across. The one in the lower uh, left-hand corner is a DF-99. And the term of all brass and glass is quite apparent when you look and see it's very he heavily uh, duty and it's made to take a lot of punishment. The two field glasses that are in the center are Galilean design, but this uh, one that looks all brass was not painted. It was left as is to, uh, because it was generally used at the ocean side to, uh, to look out for uh, the ability to monitor ships at sea. So when you look at the, even in 1914, there were, uh, in the top right, you'd see soldiers still bringing in their personal uh, Galilean style glasses that might be 10 or 15 years old. And in these various different, there are gla uh, glasses such as uh, the Prince has a 10 power glass. These are smaller, so they are six power. So each one of these had different size of uh, glasses available. In France, there were six major optic producers. And when I say, once again, producers, those were companies like Huey uh, and Krauss and others that took the glass that was produced by Paramantois or the smaller groups and turned it into a finished product. But of those, only three of those six produced prism-based optics in 1914. And there were 12 different military models. And they were a majority were Galilean as well. Three different types of rifle scopes and two different types of artillery rangefinders. Now, what is important to understand about France and their rangefinders is they did not pursue the same style as what Britain, the United States, Germany for an optical rangefinder. They used a telemeter that was handheld or a angular inclinometer, which did not use the same logic as, but that's the French being French as I, I would sometimes would say. So here are six different French binoculars and that this one is a Huey. This one is also a, a Huey. And what's interesting about the this one is, and you can't see it as easily, is that this has up here a tip-in filter on one side and a tip-in uh, reticule on the other. To the filter was to remove haze. The reticule was to help in in using for range finding. But these were at the same time what were generally sold. These two glasses in the lower corner are Le Mer, and they were sold to the United States quite commonly. And so, but the French utilized this is a, a Galilean style telescope, a battery commander style made by Krauss. Uh, some people call them trench periscopes, but the whole purpose of them is that you would spread them out so that you would get what was called better plasticity and better real ability to range to do range finding. In Britain, there were five major optics producers. There were smaller ones as well, but there were, these five were Ross, Dolan, Barnes, Stroud, uh, Atchison, there, but they were the ones that generally the government or the officers purchased from. And it was a mix of both Galilean and prism. Once again, three different rifle scopes primarily used and four different types of artillery rangefinders. So down here is a smaller size 
uh, Barnstroud FT-37, which was first designed in 1903, and that it has a single eyepiece, and it was very accurate to identify, and it would be used in a number of different ways, as you'll see in a moment. This is that Ross binocular again. This is a Dolland. Uh, this is, my mind just went blank. I can't tell you. But uh, the others are all, these are all British glasses. Here's how the rangefinder might be used for aerial with a Lewis gun. The Canadians would bought their own, even though they were part of the uh, British service, had made sure that all of their officers had higher quality glass, and so they bought their uh, binoculars through the United States at the time. And so they came equipped with prism-based binoculars that were purchased. Many of them were Zeiss, for that matter. The Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, Empire was interesting because they used German manufacturers, but they required their own Austro-Hungarian standards. The majority of these were produced were Gors or Zeiss, and otherwise they used just German produced products. But these designs that you see here are all Austrian uh, standard design, and that you can find a similar design for this glass that was made for Germany, but it's different. They were big believers in a Galilean for just short field sight, but this design is the same as a German, the center lower is the same as a German six power glass. This glass is what would be used for mountain, aerial, as well as naval. But the officers would use small little opera glasses. You would see, uh, once again, they would use uh, Galilean, as well as you can tell by the case here, uh, that is much more of a prism based, as well as this style is also a prism based for the Austrian officer. So let's move to the United States. It, like I say, it's like deja vu all over again, because in 1913, it, it, you can see that 56% of their all optical instruments came from France. They recognized it as an issue as early as 1912, and, but nothing was done. Same thing for 1914. If you notice, the United Kingdom is halved in part because war is declared and that they literally get nothing uh, from Britain from August on. But Germany is able to provide for them for at least the first half of 19, I mean, last half of 1914. So in 1915, the year before, Bachelon had only been able to produce one metric ton of glass. That sounds like a lot, but when you're dealing with 80 to 90% of waste of grinding and cutting, that it, that it really wasn't that much. They doubled the production in, by 1915. But the 1915 abridgment report said there was no quality production available. And with the optical glass drying up, there need to be greater production to be done. But nothing was done to prepare or produce within the United States. It went from one metric ton in 1914 Two metric tons in 1915. It did double up to 12, close to 12 metric tons in 1916. But when June 1917, the situation is really no better than 1915. So the Department of Commerce and the War Department convenes a meeting with the major U.S. optical glass, and this is Corning, Spencer Labs, Carnegie Institute, uh, the Geo Lab and Boshalom Kodak. And there was initial resistance, but they all realized they needed to come together to create the same quality glass as a German. And it was a, the only word for it, by that cooperative effort, 
they were able to create a product in 19 months that took Germany 25 years to create. So by January 1918, they have an acceptable formula, but production priorities will be the issue. And they won't meet the production need until 1918. So what do they do in the meantime? They purchase French Galilean or prism binoculars and not British because the British were not willing to sell them. Or they, like what the French and the British did before, they acquired them during raids or attacks on German positions. The end result, most of the US production need arrives just weeks before armistice. And when I say weeks, the majority does not really start being shipped on the boat until September, October. In the meantime, you have these ads in the National Geographic, the eyes of the Navy. And uh, everyone has heard or seen, and there's the letter that people uh, see that FDR signed in recognition uh, for people that were donated. He signed all the letters personally for the the donated glass and that would be returned if you if reused if they were not they were returned and then the same thing and this is a preview for my next presentation is that they also called for utilizing the photographic lenses as well because there was a need for aerial cameras and if we were behind on the binoculars and rangefinders, we were further behind on aerial cameras. So they were looking for anything that they could get. And once again, this is a National Geographic ad. And here's a picture of them. It may be a staged photo, uh, photograph, but you can, this is the inspection team as they're unboxing and looking at the uh, uh, binoculars as they came in. And you can see this gentleman is holding a pair of binoculars. There's a binocular there. This gentleman is holding a telescope. There's binoculars, and he's taking notes. And so it's the logic is, is that they were getting a mountain of supplies for the request. In the end, this were what the United States came up with. This is a Weiss design, uh, which is similar to a Bosch and Loam uh, binocular, and that you see almost one similar over in, in the, on the west side in, in on display. This is an early Bosch and Loam design that mo it, it mimics the German Zeiss design. This is a Spencer Labs. And it, you can't read it, but this says U.S. Navy with a serial number. And this is also an American design. But they were using French the, the Le Maire binoculars almost exclusively during the first part of 1918. So you see this up here is a Krauss uh, a sighting telescope. And it's got it's a prism base, but it's got three different viewfinders. You see battery commander binoculars here, as well as a rangefinder. You also see another battery commander, and these two officers have uh, what are Bosch and Loam binoculars. So, in comparison, let's just talk about the distribution, the wealth versus uh, the poverty of binoculars. The armies would distribute two to three binoculars per company in the German army, and the lowest level would be a Feldwebel, and that that would be a common rank to be to have binoculars in possession. And it was expected the officers would purchase them unless they were part of the machine gun brigade, and then they were provided binoculars. Those and the snipers were provided binoculars. In France, there were only one to three per regiment. And it usually it was rare, but a lieutenant, but normally it'd be a captain level. And it was expected the officer would be purchasing his own uh, binoculars. Same thing for Britain, but it was a, a more of a requirement as a requirement you were to come with 
prepared with your own set of magnification. It might be a telescope, it might be binoculars. So they were using ancient to modern binoculars. The Americans were two to four because what the patriotic donation and such, but it was also expected the officers would donate their own. In Italy and in Austro-Hungarian, it was only one to two or one to three, and the, the officers were required to provide their own binoculars. So let's look at the production level though. For binoculars, Germany produced over a million binoculars during the war. It, it, and that's an astounding figure, but those were also distributed to Austria and Turkey as well. And they were just turning them out. And that's why the, the Germans were able to have so many. That one pair of binoculars that I have a copy an example here, if you look at my, this style here, there were 150,000 of these created and given out to all the machine gun uh, units. The only five to 12,000 rangefinders, and those were the uh, type that were the Zeiss or Gores that were similar to the, the as I call it, the bar and stroud, but the horizontal. And then there were 15 to 25,000 artillery rangefinders that were for field guns and howitzers and such. France produced 400 to 600,000 binoculars. And when you look at the numbers as a whole, the numbers decreased dramatically for each country. There were only 10 to 15,000 binoculars that were created it, between 1917 to 1918. There were more created in December 1918 than during the entire year of 1917. And it, artillery rangefinders, they were using primarily the French 75s and the coastal artillery were using Bar and Stroud. Don't have any details other than the binoculars made by a Italian company only produced five, around 5,000 total during the war. And the Austro-Hungarian produced, you know, relied upon the Germans. So they took their numbers from the numbers produced by Germany. So we get to the end of the war. What happens is that binoculars, rifle scopes, and such were considered a booty and compensation for the war effort and they were dumped on the U.S. civilian market. And you'd find them in surplus ads and magazine back pages. But the higher quality German rangefinders that would be utilized, as well as the battery commander binoculars and higher quality optics were utilized by U.S. military well into the late 20s. Consequently, the floor fell out for U.S. optics demand by other than Bosch and Loam. And the, the companies like Weiss just fell by the wayside, as well as Spencer Labs and such. So their binocular is and optics companies almost went out of business, which created the new optic shortage in, in 1940 because there was the productions were not kept up. So those binoculars I was just showing you, this is a good example. These were being sold for 9.85 at the same time. Bosch and Loam civilian glass were selling for $25. Or you could pay $22.50 for high quality German glasses, and that they say they have a thousand on hand, a thousand more coming. And that was literally true. And when these glasses were in reality higher quality, and while you don't see, you see an image for a centered, a, drawn binocular center focus, it's not what usually was gotten. They were sending out home the higher quality German binoculars. But this poster was utilized both during the First World War and in the early days of the Second World War. And that's what I want to leave you with. It, 
that look at it says, no one will dare lift his eye when you lend your Zeiss or Bosch and Loam binoculars to the Navy. So thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, yeah, Steve, uh, Ken Starkey here. Um, I mean, really coverage uh, of the topic. Um, and you mentioned a future talk, but my questions are about periscopes, submarine periscopes and trench periscopes. Uh, you didn't, didn't really touch on those uh, directly. Yeah, uh, Anything you could. Um, sure. And uh, the thing, I didn't just because they're a topic on, unto themselves, especially submarine to periscopes. Now, it, no offense right. to the American Submarine Task Force, they're pretty much a, a sideshow and they're using mirror and lower quality, but not a uh, prism based compared to the higher quality Zeiss. I have a picture that is a sort of a poor quality where the Germans are literally using a submarine periscope as a sighting device on land and that they have tipped it up and they have it looking like a tree. And the battery commander design of periscopes, there's it, the thing that keep in mind is that there's periscopes and then there are battery commander. And the reason why I use the difference is, is that periscopes generally did not have any type of lateral movement. They would generally be a vertical where a battery commander, if you watch my hands, would fold across and give a better range finding capability or more plasticity. And like I said, uh, I'll tr I can work on another pr uh, presentation that can talk specifically to those because those are a topic unto themselves. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I, I think anybody else have questions? Well, Steve, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. And uh, we will hope that one day you can bring a batch of your binoculars in and do a show and tell with us, because I think it would be uh, really interesting to look through some of these things and get an idea for the difference uh, between the high quality and the lower quality and get a feel for what that might actually mean and use on the battlefield. And it would also, uh, I would bring in one of the battery commanders that I have, as well as what was called a little teleplast that is a, a seven power, but it's about eight inches tall that was made by Zeiss that officers would use just to, because of the capability. And then there were the other periscopes. So yes, I definitely hope to be able to do that. As do we. Well, we'll look forward to your discussion of aerial photography next next month. And again, thank you all for coming to this lecture, and uh, we will uh, we will adjourn.